Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sao Xiong. Um, so, give me a minute while this thing flash out. Okay, thank you, um, and thank you for the organizers for uh, accepting this talk. Um, kind of a bit last minute, I did a, a last minute switch out from a previous talk because I was about to complete this uh, uh, this project, and I thought it was a good idea to switch because, you know, already cannot do much contact switching. Um, anyway, you see some of these cute um, icons, uh, mascots here, logos, or, or whatever you call it. Uh, I have stickers of them. Yes, I, I have stickers. Uh, I have stickers for all of them, in fact. So I'm just waiting for Chi On to come here with my stickers, if he is here. Yeah, is he here? No? Okay. So anyway, I will still have the first one, so you can get it from me. And when I get it, the rest from Chion, uh, please come to me, um, ask me for one, uh, I'll, I'll pass you one. Okay, so let me start. Um, how many of you here are software developers? Okay, so the rest I assume are not, or just too shy? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so if you are a software developer, you probably know that software always changes, right? Any, any dissenting opinions here? No? Okay. I hope, yes? No? Okay. Um, so software always changes. So requirements change. For those of you who uh, talk to your product managers, uh, talk to the, your clients or whatever, this is probably something that you know about. Um, but beyond that, libraries change as well. Right? So as you code, your libraries, um, they evolve, they change. Someone drops out, someone comes back in. You know, uh, if it's open source, there's always somebody uh, trying new things, improving the, 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 the code. Um, programming languages change too. Right? So you probably code an, on this particular version of the programming language uh, one year down the road, half a year down the road, it changes. And, uh, somebody uh, upgrades it, now they are breaking changes. Okay, and of course, um, this happens pretty quickly, pretty often too, you know, uh, people change. I mean, they, they don't transform literally, but uh, that's not what I mean. Uh, but in a team, people come and go, right? So if you work professionally in, in a company, within a team, you have people who come and people who go. And uh, there are often people um, who come in, make some changes and, and go as well. So you will see that uh, things change all the time. So what does it really result in? Okay, so, uh, right, so I'm, I'm quite sure many of you have seen this before, right? Uh, dependency hell. Uh, I spent some time looking for finding this picture, yeah, so it's quite fascinating. You know. um, but reality is um, we get this all the time, right? So I think programmers get this so often that we don't really realize that this is a problem anymore, so, right? so it's like a, bit of a Stockholm syndrome here, right? So we are uh, held hostage by uh, dependency hell sometimes so much that we don't realize it. Um, a while ago, GitHub upgraded from Rails 3.2 to 5.2. Any guesses how long it took for GitHub to, any GitHubers here? No, right, okay. So you probably know the answer. Any, any guesses how long it took GitHub to actually migrate from 3.2 to 5.2? For reals? Any more? Any others? So when you guys have Stockholm Syndrome too, right? So you think it's okay. Um, and you're right, it's, it's one and a half years. Okay, and they celebrated this. They celebrated this by, by writing this blog post, okay? Uh, saying that, you know, Yes, they did this in one and a half years, okay? Imagine this is an upgrade for a framework. Right? You would think carefully about it, is, your, is a framework. Like, they're not even upgrading the software. <laughs> okay. um, and uh, for some, you say, hey, you know what the heck, you know, it's inevitable, and it's okay, and you just accept it, and, uh, uh, go on with your life, right? Uh, well, if you go on with your life, you think that's, uh, you know, that's inevitable. But I think there could be things to be done about it. And uh, really, this problem is not really an unsolvable problem. In fact, it has been solved many, many times. It's just that um, not everybody realizes how it has been solved at, at different times, right? 
So the classic case is really, the classic solution is really to remove dependency between blocks of execution. So you have different blocks of execution. You just do not let them be dependent on each other, right? So uh, essentially, you put them into uh, different, anyone to complete my sentence? You got it. So this, this is very common, right? So th those of you who have worked with microservices before, those of you who have worked with Docker, uh, containers, right? So you just make them into different containers. Somebody made a joke some time back. I, I still remember it's quite funny. He said, uh, you know, what I did was I just, you know, put my laptop on the cloud and then it will work, right? So literally that's what Docker is, right? They just containerize your code and then just pump it up to the, on the cloud. So that's okay if you are talking about an entire server, but what about web applications? So what do you do with uh, web applications? Because web application is a single application, right? You, it's not broken up into like, different services. It is not, uh, I mean, with Dockerize a web application, you'd basically Dockerize the entire web application. So how do you maintain um, separation between different, or within the, the application itself, such that you prevent dependency hell? Okay. Uh, so, sort of wind down a little bit to talk about software as a whole. Okay, so where we talk about software, we're talking, talking about uh, software applications, right? We're not really talking about drivers, we're not talking about uh, uh, operating system or anything lower level. Uh, we're really talking about applications, people, things that you and I use. So uh, generally there's a request, um, an application is supposed to give you a response. So correspondingly in a web application, you also send a request and you get a response. So let's break it down a little bit. Okay, so uh, this is gonna be a bit fundamental, so and for a large number of you, since you're developers, you might be a bit um, too basic, but bear with me for a while, uh, I'll explain. So um, when you send in a request, basically there's an action on an object. And sometimes you have modifiers, right? Um, in the HTTP lingo, which is on the web, uh, basically, this is it, right? You have a method on a URL. And sometimes you have modifiers like the, the body or the header. Uh, how about the response? Okay, in any software application, the response could be anything that the uh, application wants to return to you. But very specifically for web applications, this is supposed to be what is returned to you. Uh, it's a HTTP response, which is basically a status, header, and a body. Okay, so let's move on to what a web application is. Um, so, how many of you have developed web applications before? Okay, a good number of you, right? So you know uh, what comes next. Essentially, web application, you have a router, and uh, this router is a or multiplexer or whatever you want to call it. It takes in a request, and then you say, okay, which handler should I pass it on to? Who should be handling this? Right? And then you just shuffle it to, to the uh, corresponding handler. So this is a very, very common model. Of course, if you're a single-use app web application, you probably lump everything into one, right? Um, but in general, if you're writing a uh, web application into multiple things, then you probably be, you will have more than one handler. And uh, what are some of the models of doing web applications? So this is a very common model. This is a very, very, I mean, I would say very old. This is a little bit older model. This is a model you see in things like uh, CGI, right? Fast CGI, uh, Apache, Nginx, and uh, and so on and so forth, right? So what you have is a router within the web server, and it will hand it off to different handlers, right? So anyone program here in CGI before? Come on, you can admit it. <laughs> There's nothing to be ashamed of, right? And then, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, I explain how, how this works uh, in, in a while. Um, fast CGI, it's a little bit esoteric, but fast CGI, anyway. Uh, I bet a lot of people have uh, done like um, stuff on PHP using uh, Apache mods, like mod PHP, like Mr. PHP here himself, yeah. um, and so on and so forth. So like, this is a very common model. But what is more common, and uh, this is more like something you will find in enterprise web applications, is what is called the application uh, model, right? Application server model, sorry. So the application server um, is the same thing. You have a web server, which does all the routing. And then you have a, an application server, and this is a server that you put in all your handlers, right? 
So if you have, say, a Java application server, right, then you have all your Java um, handlers in there. Right? And of course, you have fancy different names for it, and enterprises are prone to creating their own like, branding on what kind of uh, things they call their handlers. But essentially, they're handlers. If you program in Ruby, then you will find Ruby handlers. Right? So you program in PHP, you like uh, Zen um, server, you have uh, PHP handlers. Python has their own handlers, and so on and so forth. This is a very, very common model. So common people really sometimes don't even think about it. Right? They say, look, this is the way it works. But if you sort of wind down a little bit, you can see how it evolves So from a router to handler. But if you look at this um, handlers within the uh, application server, you realize all of these handlers uh, are written in a single application, oh, sorry, single programming language, right? So I talk about Java application servers, all in Java. Ruby application servers, all in Ruby, right? And so on and so forth. What if you then switch it out and uh, I allow you to write your handlers in different programming language, <coughs> different blocks of execution that are independent from each other. You can use different programming languages, and you can do the things that you want. In fact, you can have the same programming language, but using different libraries, different versions of the programming language, different uh, libraries, or even the same one if you want to. Right? All of these things are within your control. You can, let's say, I want to dockerize it, right? So each handler can be in a separate docker as well. Bit of an overkill, but possible. So this essentially is Tanuki. Right? I've been working on this puzzle for many years, right? I, uh, I have tried different iterations of it. This is uh, our most recent iteration. Uh, some of you who know me uh, in the past, I, I've written a, a, another framework I call Polyglot. Uh, there was a different attempt to this. Uh, I realized that it was a bit complicated because um, I tried to use 0MQ to be the, the, the middle layer. Not, not a lot of people like to write 0MQ um, servers, so um, ended up not that uh, popular. So anyway, I was thinking that uh, this time around, I would just write it in a much more simpler way, and I'll explain how, how this works. Okay? So if we can see this, then essentially the most important part of all of these things is really the handlers. Right? So what are Tanuki handlers? I have different types of handlers. Basically, I have three types of handlers. So, uh, the first one is I call bins. Okay, um, uh, they are basically binary or uh, script executable. They are executable files. Right, everything is self-contained within one, um, and there's obviously running locally within your your uh, the same machine that you're running Tanuki. The second is uh, local listener. Um, local listeners are basically um, TCP socket servers. Right, running in a a particular port on the same machine that's local. That's why it's local listener. And finally, there's a remote listener. The remote listener means that it, it runs uh, elsewhere. So um, what happens if you run a remote server? So literally, you can distribute your application, your web application, to anywhere within the network. So let's get on to it. Uh, a bin. Um, a bin, the model is the same. Request, response, right? So. Um, you send in a request, the request, the request is basically in JSON, and the response is back in JSON as well. Right? Uh, why JSON? Like, uh, essentially, I want to make it the simplest way possible. So if you write in any programming language, anything uh, that can actually do some decent amount of work, you'll probably be able to, uh, you probably should be able to manipulate strings, right? Because ultimately, JSON is just a string. Uh, best is, of course, you have a JSON library that you can use to manipulate it. If you don't, then at least uh, if you ma just manipulate strings, you're able to, to handle it. And I'll show you something that's kind of a basic later as well. So how do you pass this JSON to the binary file? Because after all, it's just an executable, right? Um, you use the calling argument. You send it as part of a calling argument, and then uh, as part of standard out, you return the response. Right? Pretty straightforward. So you just write any application, you take in your argument, that's your request, and then you emit um, your response out into standard out. Okay, so that's a, a bin. A request, uh, sorry, a, a listener. Um, a listener does exactly the same thing. The only difference is that it's a TCP socket server instead of a binary. Okay, and of course you open up the socket, you send in your JSON request, and then you get your JSON 
uh, response, right? That's, that's basically it. So how does this request JSON look like? It's kind of small, uh, and I sort of uh, removed quite a bit of things. So this is, this is JSON, right? So this basically contains uh, all the information that you will get from a, a, an actual request. So you're saying, wow, does it mean I need to, uh, does it mean I need to process, uh, does it mean I need to, to create all of these things? The answer is no, right? This is something that you need to process, okay? So if you can process JSON and any decent JSON library, in fact, any library will be able to process this. Okay, they are, because they are all strings. And what's the response? So now this is what you need to return. This is what you need to create and send back to the uh, calling program, okay, which is uh, response. And as I mentioned earlier on, there are just three things that you need to provide. The first is the status. So that's the HTTP status code, right, the 200s to 300s, 400s. Then you have your header. Header is um, what you want to pass along uh, as information, and of course, uh, the body, okay? Um, and that's it. That's, that's really it. That's all you need to do, right? So I was literally trying to make it the simplest way possible to write an application that you can use multiple programming language to write it, okay? Let me just quickly go through some of this uh, code. Uh, let me show you how it looks like in, in Ruby. And this is a bit, okay? It's a very simple bin. You can see it's a script. Um, you require the JSON library, uh, JSON gem here. You pass the argument, and then you respond with the, the status, the header. I have no headers. Now, if I want to pass on something, let's say I want to, uh, to uh, make this a persistent, right? So I put in a cookie and do, do the header. Yeah, uh, and finally a body. A body here, I use text, but Generally speaking, if you're talking about web application, you should be returning HTML, right? Obviously, if you're returning, say, uh, REST API, right? So you might want to return this in uh, JSON as well, or you, if you want to return this as uh, XML, then um, you can return this as XML, and whatsoever, right? Uh, as Ruby, of course, you put string, and you just put response.json. It is that simple, okay? Um, Go, this is how it looks like. I simplified it a bit. Uh, Go is a little bit more complicated to, to write, but also not as complicated. Here, um, you see here there's a header that I, I put in, uh, the set cookie. So literally, I set a cookie, hello equals world, um, and I persist this, right? So let's say now you want to do login. Uh, logins, if you know what applications, they are basically set in your, your cookie, right? So it's a persistent session cookie that you, you remove at the end of the day. Uh, here, what you do is just set a cookie and then your application proceeds as per normal. Okay. Uh, Python, this is, a, this is a listener. Okay, you create sockets, you import a socket and uh, JSON and so on. Uh, the port here is a little bit different. If it's a local, if it's a local listener, then basically the calling argument is the port that you want, the, this is the port that this will be running on. Because Tanoki will actually call this script and start it up as a TCP socket server. And when it does that, it will pass the port across to the, uh, the script, and the script will start with that port. So Tanoki will know uh, further on, this is how you will be sending the, the data across. Of course, if, you, if it's a remote listener, there's no way you can actually trigger that start. So what you do, um, at least at this point in time, um, so what you do is you need to actually put it in the configuration setting. Okay, again, this is, this is Python. Okay, so I will come to the demo itself. So this is a live demo, so wish me luck. <laughs> All right, so um, let me show you the, the code here. This is, um, this is a, a slightly more complicated uh, Ruby script uh, there's a bin. So again, you pass the argument. Uh, this is the response. All right. Um, so yeah. So normally, when you pass this on, right? I earlier said that uh, you send it on as the, to the handler. But you know, in HTTP, there are different types of uh, methods, right? So you have your get, your post, or whatever it is. Uh, Tanuki can handle all of it, but you need to to figure out yourself, right? Does this handle? Um, a get, does this handle a post, or does it handle both? 
In this case, I handle both in this particular script, but you can actually separate it. Here, um, I check on the request method. If it's get, I will just... Data read is a very special property of Ruby. Basically, what it does is anything after the underscore, underscore, n underscore, underscore, right? So anything after this will be returned as pure text, and uh, you return this, okay? So, uh, so how do you actually configure the handlers? There's a YAML file that you configure. Uh, these are all the handlers. This is a bin, right? Uh, there's a path, it's what type is it? And a path to the actual script here. So that's the hello script, hello Ruby script. Uh, hello bash, yes, I've written a handler in bash. Uh, Go, uh, this is PHP, this is Rust, I've done this in Rust too. Um, Ruby, so, so what method you want to use, you can, you can set it up here. I want to get, I want to post, I want to put, whatever, delete or whatever that you, you want. Uh, these are the local listeners. And if it's a remote listener, then you need to specify the port as well, because otherwise Tanuki don't know where to actually call this from. All right, so let me just do a quick start. Uh, okay, so basically I started off this uh, uh, server in 8080, and uh, you, you see I, I've done my homework here, right? So. Um, okay, so simple login form here. Of course, it doesn't really do anything at this point in time. I've, I've not advanced beyond that. Uh, so if it's a get, it will read whatever is here. So this is a simple um, login form. And when it's a put, I will say hello, whoever, whoever, right? So did I do this? Parameter you name. Password is basically useless, right? So, hello, Geek Camp 2019. Let's hope this works. Right. Now, how, how fast is this? Obviously, not very fast. Yeah, this is, after all, a script that you call and it triggers. So, it's about 204 microseconds to do the, uh, the get and 213 to do the post. Yeah. Let me try something else here. Um, let's try uh, hello Ruby. So hello Ruby. It's a little bit faster because there's a lot less to, to write to. Hello go. Go, okay. Yeah, it's the first time it's been called. It's about 10 milliseconds. Okay. Uh, hello. Rust. I think I still have Rust. Do I have Rust? Yeah, it's about 3 milliseconds. Okay, so that's a bin. Let's look at... Um, oh, shit. This actually didn't work because I didn't pass it properly. Um... So let me look at the, do I have this? I can't really remember. Uh, so the Ruby listener, uh, about 700, 800 microseconds. Okay, so it's a lot faster. Uh, I think I have to go listener here. Uh, about 600 microseconds. 600 microseconds. At this point in time, it doesn't really matter because it's, it's very simple. Obviously, as things become a lot more complicated, then uh, the speed will come up. So uh, there are a lot more facilities within Tanuki. I'm just doing an introduction to this today. Uh, please feel free to explore. Let me go to the link. I Uh, github.com Saoshong Tanuki So this is the website. Uh, please feel free to check it out. Give it a couple of stars. 
you know, uh, thank you. Um, it will tell you everything that I've done so far here. Feel free to contribute to it as well, you know, the, um, and make changes and, and so on. Uh, I talked about the, um, the bash just now. So the bash one is actually pretty simple, right? Um, so you guys like writing your web applications in bash, please feel free to go crazy. But yeah, it's not, not, not so straightforward. Yeah. So I basically use this uh, JQ uh, JSON query parser to do this. It's, it's a bit of a trick, and uh, I don't think you should do this in the long run. But uh, if you feel like doing it, uh, go crazy. Yeah. And also try different languages. If you try any different languages, please do contribute to the, the list. Uh, and, and check out the rest as well. So thank you. And uh, come get your stickers from me later. Oh. So we got one question for Sao Xiong. Why is it called Tanuki? Oh, okay. So um, anyone knows what Tanuki is? Anyone, any like uh, Japanese culture lovers, geeks? Yeah. Anyone here knows what Tanuki is? Only Ian? Surely not, right? So anyway, Tanuki is the Japanese raccoon dog. It's an actual animal. Um, it's an actual animal, but it's also a mythological animal. Um, it's supposed to be an animal that's able to transform itself into different kinds of uh, creatures, including human beings, right? So they're actually famous for being able to transform into human beings. And uh, the reason why I use Tanuki is uh, basically um, application can transform itself into to anything, right? So into any programming language, any library. So you don't really need to write, say, in multiple languages. I'm just doing this because I, I'm, I'm showing off, actually. Uh, but you could write the whole thing in Go, for example. You could write the whole thing. If it, it, if it fits you, you can write the whole thing in Go, in Rust, in, uh, you know, in C, if you want to, C++. You know. uh, I was trying to do it in Cobalt, but then I, I realized that uh, yeah, it's going to take some time for me to, to learn it again. Um, so yeah, that's the reason why it's called Tanuki. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Sao Xiong. Yes.